Kill all sons of bitches. That's my official instructions. LS, Nick, Coach and Rochelle meet each other under unfortunate circumstances of missing a rescue helicopter. As they traverse across several zombie-infested towns and states, in efforts to find some sort of redemption, they get to form a strong bond with each other. It's only till the very end where their first hopeful fate turns into a grim, uncertain one. Hi folks, I'm R, your narrator. You can follow me on Twitter where you can send me game suggestions and just generally catch up. This video will contain spoilers about the game. With that in mind, let's begin. Roughly about a week after the first four survivors set out to be rescued from the Mercy Hospital, four other survivors who are presumably immune to the green flu, called Nick, a pessimistic gambler and a con artist, Ellis, a talkative southerner mechanic, Coach, a high school football coach with a bad knee, and Rochelle, a low-level production assistant that worked for a local TV station that was reporting on the pandemic, get on a roof of a hotel in Savannah, Georgia, where a rescue helicopter leaves soon after, not seeing them and leaving them behind. The survivors introduce themselves to each other, with Nick not being too keen to hang around and predicting that they will soon go their different ways after getting rescued. Where's Nick? Anyone get bit? Whew. Isn't that how this works? I don't think so. My friends call me coach. I guess y'all can do the same. Hey, name's Rochelle. You? Ellis. Pleasure to meet you, Rochelle. Three new special infected are introduced here, called the Charger, a powerful pinner, jockey, a small-sized creature that incapacitates the survivors, and finally the spitter, who pukes acidic vomit, depleting the survivors' health. As the survivors make their way down to the city, they observe the numerous evac and quarantine zones that have been set up, yet with no one tending them, displaying that all of the efforts of Sida have been in vain trying to combat the infection. They then travel to a nearby shopping mall where presumably an evac zone has been set up. To their disappointment, they witness that the evac zone has been abandoned, with its staff and operators whether being dead or infected. With the mall overrun by zombies, Ellis then talks about a local car racer whom he perceived as his idol, called Jimmy Gibb, when he gets the bright idea to use his stock car in the shopping mall and drive it to New Orleans the presumable last standing city without any zombies. Check it out! That's Jimmy Gibbs Jr. God damn it, I could have gotten a picture taken with Jimmy Gibbs stock car. Cedar's not gonna save us. Any ideas? Actually, I've been thinking, so I have been thinking Jimmy Gibbs stock car was around here somewhere. We just gotta find it, mess it up, and I'll drive I'll agree to the idea, but I'm driving. What a fun road trip this will be. They manage to get in the car and reach the town of Rayford, where the other green flu carrier survivors are held up, trying to get the sailboat into open waters to travel to Florida Keys. As the bridge is raised, the current four survivors get instructed to power the generator and bring it down from the other side, so they can go across the river on their way to New Orleans. Meanwhile, after chatting with Zoe, Ellis displays how shy and inexperienced he is with girls, confessing that he finds Zoe very attractive and that he has fallen for her. We're having a uh I'm probably out of two days talking, man. What do you think? You've been killing zombies for the better part of two days, boy. You can talk to a girl. No, I can't. Look at her. You're gonna need to get to the other side of the bridge. We can help you there. Okay. The boy says thank you. Coach, come on, man. <laughs> As they get underway to find fuel and start the generator, they witness a wedding which ended tragically with the bride becoming a witch and the groom a zombie alongside the other guests. As Nick raises his concerns that the other survivors might not be trustworthy, 
Rochelle expresses how she had a good feeling about Francis. Unsurprisingly, when they meet up, Rochelle flirts with Francis, which makes it awkward for the other survivors standing there hopeless, observing their display of affection. The four survivors refuel the generator while the other group supports them from the above the bridge, when they manage to lower the bridge and drive off. Jimmy Gibbs car seems to work well until they reach a road with numerous abandoned vehicles blocking the way. Coach, being optimistic, theorizes that these people might have left their intact functional vehicles as they were rescued, to which the pessimistic Nick sarcastically points out to be just a theory. Coach points out that this place contains an amusement park called the Whispering Oaks, to which they see strong searchlights emitting from in the distance. They head there in hopes that there might be an evac zone as there are still functional lights, but to their dismay, they discover that the lights are still operational from the amusement park with no healthy human at sight. These lights were set up for midnight riders who were scheduled to play there before the apocalypse. As they fight their way through a zombie infested amusement park, they notice a rescue helicopter flying overhead searching for any survivors. As the chopper doesn't notice them, Coach gets an idea to use the Midnight Rider's equipment to attract their attention. This has a direct negative impact as well, with hordes of zombies being attracted, with the survivors having to fend for themselves until they are collected by the chopper. After a short challenging while, they get in the chopper and fly away. This is however not a happy ending, as their luck soon runs out when the pilot turns into a zombie, with Nick being forced to shoot him dead. The chopper crashes in Bayou, where the survivors find themselves in a small village where some of its inhabitants try to fortify their houses and fend for themselves, who ultimately failed and died. They explore deeper in the village, where they reach an alligator farm. There they find a wreckage of a plane which they need to cross through. That leaves them with no option than to pop open the emergency door which attracts a lot of zombies. They manage to defend themselves and reach a plantation house where they use a radio and communicate with Virgil, who informs them that he will be with them shortly with his boat to extract them. After a challenging stand-up with hordes of zombies, Virgil arrives and picks them up. On their way to New Orleans, Virgil drops them off in a town to retrieve some fuel as his boat runs low on it. After the survivors are dropped off, thinking that this will be an easy task, they realize they forgot their weapons bag, which also included a flare gun which they needed to use to inform Virgil when they're ready. Things only get worse as the local gas station is out of gas, with a storm commencing, restricting the survivors' visibility. As they head to the next closest gas station, two miles away, they pass through a sugarcane mill infested with witches, with the storm worsening. As they manage to fight through them and get close to the boat, Ellis has a bright idea to use a burger tank sign instead of the flare gun to notify Virgil of their arrival. Virgil soon arrives and picks up the group to New Orleans. After a while, they arrive in New Orleans and Virgil bids them farewell and goes on to rescue other survivors. The group plans to go to the bridge in the distance, believing it's their best bet of survival, when they see military fighter jet planes flying overhead. Coach sees it as a sign of good luck and their redemption, but Nick expresses his skepticism. They soon realize that the pathetic efforts of Sida at containing the disease had been replaced by the military, who is bombing the city now, not actually looking for survivors anymore. After witnessing some corpses of non-infected people, they realize that the military is killing the carriers who have contracted the green flu but don't show any signs. Some writings on the walls also suggest that the people's impression on carriers is that they are equivalent to zombies and must die. This raises alarm as the survivors are actually carriers as they don't show any symptoms and signs of turning. The survivors with no option left decide to trust the military and interfere with a radio transmission between two soldiers addressed as Rescue 7 and Papa Gator. That's coming from the bridge! Bridge! Identify yourself! 
My name's Nick. There's four of us on the... on the west end of the bridge. Brick, are you immune? We are not infected. Negative, Brick. Are you immune? Have you encountered the infected? Yeah, you can say that. Rescue 7, are you equipped for carriers? A affirmative, propagator. Bridge, we have pulled out of that sector. Your only remaining pickup is available on the other end of the bridge. Our last chopper is leaving in 10 minutes. Sure, give us a few minutes. Propagator insists on asking if the survivors are immune to which the survivors act careful. But after the soldiers' persistence, they answer that they have encountered zombies, but are sure to be immune. Which leads Propagator to ask Rescue 7 if they are equipped for carriers. This raises concerns to what sort of equipment they were talking about. The soldiers assuming the survivors are carriers, instructing them to get across the bridge as their last helicopter will leave in 10 minutes. As the survivors reach Rescue 7's chopper, they are extracted with the military jets bombing the bridge in order to contain the zombies within the city. With their fate unclear, it's left for speculation to what would happen to the survivors. As previously witnessed, Propagator seemed very persistent in acquiring about whether the survivors encountered zombies and assumed that they are carriers, instructing Rescue 7 to proceed as planned if they are equipped for carriers. Being equipped for carriers is not very well explained and it's only presumed that being equipped means having the training and tools to contain and possibly detain the survivors under surveillance. According to the non-infected corpses, a large group killed them in cold blood, assuming they are carriers whether they were or not actually. It's not very clear if the military actually executed them, as on the walls within a safe room, people express their worries about carriers and how they are equal to zombies. Therefore, it's a possibility a group of survivors killed people who encountered zombies and didn't turn assuming that they are carriers. Also, the military could quite simply leave the survivors on the bridge rather than extracting them if they wanted to kill them. Therefore, it's a possibility that the military intends to run tests on the survivors in efforts to find a possible cure. Whether this fate is going to be any better than death is up to debate. They will possibly act as detained lab rats who will be tested on very likely inhumanely until they die due to complications. If you haven't watched the first video about Left 4 Dead 1, I highly recommend you to do so as it will answer many unanswered questions here. If you enjoyed this video, you can watch more by hitting on the cards on the screen and you can stay tuned by hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell. It's been your host, Star, and as always, have a fantastic day.